Okay, good evening everybody and welcome to the LSE for this online event, Regimes of Inequality, Political Economy of Health and Wealth. Um, my name is Jonathan Hopkin and I'm a Professor of Comparative Politics at the LSE in the Departments of Government and the European Institute. Uh, and it's uh, a delight for me to be here to welcome Julia Lynch to the LSE today. Uh, Julia is Professor of Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania and her research is, uh, spans a broad range of topics I'm very interested in, the politics of inequality, public health, and social policy in the rich democracies, with a particular emphasis on the US and, and Europe. Um, she's written by now several books. Uh, first, Age and Welfare State, which is, uh, was published by Cambridge in 2006, I think it was. And she has a new book out, published last year again, again by Cambridge, Regimes of Inequality, the Political Economy of Health and Wealth. And that's going to be the main focus of her talk uh, tonight. But she's also uh, co-authored a book which is coming out shortly called The Unequal Pandemic, COVID-19 and Health Inequalities, alongside Claire Bambra and Catherine Smith. So today she's going to be discussing uh, the themes of these books, uh, both uh, Resumes of Inequality, the book that came out last year, which traces uh, largely unsuccessful attempts of Western European governments since 1980 to reduce socioeconomic inequalities in health and explain the role political leaders have in persisting inequality. This book also sheds light on the causes of cross-national similarities and differences in social policy responses to COVID-19. Um, and so this is a, a key aspect of what she's going to talk to us tonight. So this uh, very topical uh, book on health inequality um, uh, connects with a very even more topical book on, on inequalities in COVID-19. Um, the argument is, well, I'll leave it to Julie to, to explain, but the, the welfare regimes of uh, democracies over the post-war period have cast a very long shadow and have interacted with place-specific forms of neoliberalism in the more recent era to short-circuit efforts to reduce inequalities in health and underlying socioeconomic status. And that legacies of these early welfare regimes continue to shape government's efforts to control health inequalities during the COVID-19 era. So um, just a couple of practical announcements before we start and I hand over to Julia. For those Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE COVID-19, easy to remember. This online event's being recorded and will be made available as a podcast, subject to no technical difficulties. And as usual, there will be a QA. and a will be a chance for you to put your questions to Julia. To submit questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be submitted to us and I will um, pass them on to Julia, as many questions as, as we can fit in the time available. Please, when you, uh, when you add your question to the Q&A, Q please uh, add your name and affiliation. And we're particularly keen to hear from our students, alumni and incoming students. So please point that out. Um, but that's all from me. I'm uh, delighted to hand over to Julia for what is definitely going to be a fascinating talk. So over to you. Thanks very much, Jonathan. I am so delighted to be here. I was supposed to visit in person, I think on May 25th last year. And um, this is our best attempt to reschedule. So let me go ahead and share my screen now. All right, uh, are you all able to see my PowerPoint slideshow at this point? Okay, great. So about 150 years ago, democracies discovered how to reduce inequality by, reduce, by redistributing income, by engaging in targeted public spending and by regulating markets. And then around about 1990, a little bit earlier in the UK and the US, um, these rich democracies, um, the politicians seem to develop amnesia. First on the right and then on the left, these kinds of policy tools that they had previously used to try to keep inequality within reasonable bounds started to become off limits or even taboo. 
And at the same time, the issue of health started to become wrapped up in public conversations around inequality. First researchers and public health experts and eventually politicians on the center left who had abandoned the old ways of reducing inequality started looking at health equity as an issue that could potentially work for them politically as a way to signal that they were interested in getting back to a more egalitarian society. Fast forward to 2021 and it's become abundantly clear that that didn't work. The pandemic has been experienced in a highly unequal way with many more deaths and illnesses occurring among groups that are already on the short end of the inequality stick. So this leads us to wonder why didn't shifting the focus to health, health inequalities and to health equity in the 1990s and 2000s help to reduce inequality more broadly or put another way, why have both economic and health inequalities been so resilient over the last 30 years. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about two recent books in order to try to answer this question. So these are the two books that Jonathan mentioned earlier, Regimes of Inequality, which came out in January of last year, um, which <laughs> was not great timing uh, in some senses, but in other ways turned out to be remarkably prescient. Um, this is a book that, that discussed why politicians and policymakers have had so much trouble reducing health inequalities. Um, and secondly, this new book, which uh, should be out on um, June 15th, of this year, The Unequal Pandemic, um, co-authored with Claire Bambra and Kat Smith. So I think it's fair to say that rising inequality really is the central political fact of our time. You've probably all seen a graph, if not this graph, then one very much like it. This one shows the share of national income that was earned by those in the top 1% of the income distribution rising inexorably uh, over time, not only in the US and the UK, which are the top two lines, but also really across Europe. Uh, rising inequality has been a phenomenon that is that has affected um, really all, almost all of the rich democracies. And it's not just income that is distributed unequally. Um, this graph shows the change in the relative index of inequality in all-cause mortality, which is a measure of, of health equity um, between the most educated and least educated groups. This is for men. And again, we see across Europe a rise between the mid-1970s and the late 2000s in this, in this one measure of health inequality. Um, and we could look at many other measures that's, that would show similar patterns. So this is a little puzzling. I mean, I think we've all sort of gotten used to the idea of rising inequality, um, but this really is puzzling, particularly in light of the fact that most of political science says that reducing inequality should actually be really easy. Um, some of the key models that we use in political science to think about um, how governments respond um, to what's going on in their environment and among the electorate, um, tell us that as inequality rises, there should be more pressure to reduce inequality and that governments should in fact respond to that pressure by reducing inequality. Um, however, while we've seen in public opinion survey after public opinion survey, that majority of the public in the rich democracies favors greater government action to reduce inequality, governments haven't responded by reducing inequality. So what's going on? We fortunately have other theories, um, which also might help us understand why it is that governments don't always reduce inequality, even though these sort of simple voter centric models suggest that they should. So one set of theories comes to us from economics. And these theories argue that essentially governments don't reduce inequality because they can't. That there's something about the way that our economies are organized in this day and age, um, the kinds of returns to skills and the kinds of returns to capital uh, that are generated by the economies that we live in that make rising inequality essentially inevitable. And yet we know that this isn't true. Um, even a figure, 
who has contributed mightily to this literature, Thomas Piketty, argues very strongly that in fact, um, what we need to combat this is politics and that political choices can combat um, the rising inequality that might be generated by some of these economic trends. A second set of theories um, tries to help us understand the resilience of inequality by arguing that politicians don't reduce inequality because they don't want to. Um, and the reason they don't want to is that the power of capital holders, the people who benefit from the current unequal status quo is so overwhelming that politicians won't reduce inequality, that capital holders always get what they want. And while there's surely something to this argument, just as there's surely something to the argument that skill bias technological change is happening, um, it's, it's not sufficient. We know that in the post-war period, economic elites have never ruled alone. They have always ruled in coalition. And the managed capitalisms of, of the post-war economy in Europe are, have always been compromises between capital holders and those who are not holders of capital. So there's something, there's gotta be something else going on here. So I argue, well, I'll get to my argument in a minute. <laughs> First, let me say that in regimes of inequality, I try to take on these two sort of major explanations for the persistence of inequality. Um, and I do this by conducting process tracing case studies of policymaking efforts around reducing health inequalities from the period roughly 1980 onward. And I look at three country cases, the UK, France, and Finland, um, all of which try but ultimately fail to reduce health inequalities. And so there's a sort of most different systems method of agreement. Why are these very different kinds of political economies all failing to reduce inequality during this period? Um, and I get at, try to get at the answers to these questions um, primarily through archival research and interviews um, and also using some quantitative and qualitative content analysis. Okay, so the central argument of regimes of inequality is that, well, there's probably something to the usual suspects, these economic arguments and political arguments about sort of the inexorable power of capital, um, that there's something else going on too. And that resilient inequality is really also about the way that politicians talk about what inequality is as a public problem. And a central contribution of this work, I think, is to point out that inequality is not just something that's out there that politicians have to deal with, that inequality is a politically constructed problem and that the way that it's constructed politically um, contributes to the difficulties that we have in, in solving the problem. So I argue in the book that we see a reframing by politicians of the problem of inequality beginning in the 1990s, and that this reframing affects the kinds of policy solutions that people come to view as reasonable responses to inequality, and that this reduced range of policy solutions is ultimately what makes it harder to address inequality. So I wanna start you out um, with the observation that center-left politicians in general want to be for equality. They are from the center-left and that's what it means to be a leftist politician. It, it, it means to be responsive to a political ideology that says more equality is generally better. But at the same time, they're afraid. They're afraid of what middle-class voters want they're not totally sure, but they think they, they think they know that middle-class voters above all don't really want to pay more taxes. Um, and they're also worried about being seen as economically credible with financial markets and with the media. Um, and I have a few sprinkled throughout this presentation, a few um, quotations from some of the interviews that I did all in this case um, from the UK, because I figure it's the case you most likely to be familiar with. Um, so here we're talking about the Labor Party. A Labor Party activist um, says, well, generally politicians, labor politicians, don't like to talk too much about inequality, but nobody wants to be for inequalities either, right? So even when we get to the era of new labor, where there's a kind of a move away from talking about inequality, you know, let's not go too far. 
uh, a new labor advisor said the labor government didn't want to explicitly address income inequality. That would be political suicide. So there's this sort of tension between wanting to be for more equality, but being afraid of talking about inequality in the ways that they had always talked about it in the past. So where does this fear come from? I argue in the book that this fear comes from the interaction between the post-war settlements, the welfare regimes that were constructed after World War II, which had set political limits on the extent of inequality that markets could be allowed to generate. These post-war settlements came into conflict beginning in the 1980s with a new set of ideas about the proper relationship between governments and markets. So things that these governments used to do they used to redistribute through tax and spending. They used to spend a lot on social programs, you know, sometimes racking up large deficits. Um, and they used to regulate markets for labor and product markets. Um, these types of tools uh, increasingly came into conflict with a rising neoliberal paradigm and became taboo. So the idea of political taboos plays a large role in my book. Um, which, you know, for those of you who know me and kind of know my style as a political scientist, it may be somewhat surprising because it's a little sort of squishy and constructivist, even for me. <coughs> Excuse me. So I want to talk to you a little bit about this idea of taboos. <coughs> Pardon me, spring allergies are kicking in here. Okay, so what are these taboos against talking about these old tools of, re of managing inequality. Well, first of all, they're self-reported. So I didn't set out to write a book about taboos. <coughs> this is what my interviewees told me that was going on. They kept mentioning this word taboo. So taboos are self-reported to me, the, the researcher. They're also self-imposed. So these are restrictions that politicians place upon themselves against discussing certain kinds of policy options. And I find that the taboos were most likely to develop around the policy levers that were central to containing inequality in a particular welfare regime during the post-war period, and that these differed across European welfare regimes. Taboos, though, were not hard constraints on what politicians and policymakers could do to reduce inequality. They were given force by the perceptions and beliefs of these politicians and policymakers about what would happen should they fail to heed the prescriptions of the new neoliberal policy paradigm. So both in a strategic sense, sort of thinking, well, what, what would the sun or the bond market say? What would middle class voters want? But also in a normative sense. In, what is the correct responsible way to run an economy? Um, center left politicians came to believe um, in the words of Margaret Thatcher that there is no alternative to neoliberalism, that this actually was a reasonable thing to do. So given that these taboos have arisen against discussing inequality in the ways that welfare regimes of the post-war period were best equipped to deal with it, what happens next? once these taboos arise. What I found is that in response to these new taboos, center-left politicians reframe what the issue of inequality is. They go from talking about inequality as a problem of the maldistribution of economic resources or of power in society to talking about it as a problem of unequal human capital, in this instance, health inequality. As one new labor advisor said to me, labor party leaders are keen to talk about health inequalities, provided they don't have to talk about income and wealth inequalities. So there's this really clear reframing of the issue of inequality going on. And the picture to, on the right side of the screen, it may be a little too small for you all to read, uh, but the, the two lines that you see there, the orange line is showing sort of a, a slow but fairly steady decline in mentions in the in the UK Hansard of redistribution and inequality and a very sharp rise starting in the 1980s and really accelerating in the late 1990s in discussions of health inequality. Um, so there is clearly some reframing of what the issue of inequality is. 
So what is this new issue of inequality? It's worth taking a second to think about some of the characteristics of this as an issue. So in most European countries, health inequalities are defined as differences in average health, either morbidity or mortality, across socioeconomic groups in society. This is a little different from the US where, uh, inequal where health inequalities have typically been defined in, in more racialized terms. But in Europe, it's generally about socioeconomic inequalities in health. And so, for example, we could think about a five to eight year gap, depending on the country, in life expectancy between blue collar workers and professionals. This is just sort of one example of a, the kind of health inequality you see discussed a lot during this period. It's worth noting that these inequalities are not primarily caused by barriers to accessing health care. Again, in Europe, we're talking about systems where most people have relatively unconstrained access to health care. Um, but they're also not due to unconstrained individual lifestyle choices. So there's the next story that people usually turn to when trying to explain unequal health outcomes is, well, if it's not about not being able to get seen by a doctor, it must be about you know, smoking and diet. Social epidemiologists, however, have documented um, very convincingly that the kinds of lifestyle choices that contribute to health inequalities across the life course are anything but unconstrained. They are very, very strongly related to socioeconomic inequality. So strongly, in fact, that socioeconomic inequality is described as a fundamental cause of inequalities in health. And yes, it operates through multiple uh, social determinants of health, like education or housing or the quality of the air that you breathe. Um, but it's still at the bottom of the river, it's the socioeconomic inequality that's driving these health inequalities. Um, again, operates through multiple pathways um, and with results that accumulate across the life course. So I've just told you a little bit about the problem of health inequality very, very briefly, um, because it's really important to understand what is the difference between thinking about inequality as a problem of health, medicalizing it, versus thinking about it as a problem of fundamentally about the maldistribution of economic resources. And you wouldn't think it would make that much of a difference because health inequality and economic inequality at the end of the day are the same problem, right? Socioeconomic inequality, as I've just said, is the fundamental cause of health inequalities. Here's the thing though, health inequality as a problem has attributes that make it a much harder problem to solve. It's got this complex distal causation, multiple social determinants of health operating across the life course. It requires very complex policy tools to try to solve. For example, health and all policies or joined up government, which I'll discuss more in a second. And finally, there's a lack of a strong evidence base about what would actually work to, to reduce health inequalities in part because of this complex distal causation. You can't just run an RCT on a new program that's designed to affect one social determinant of health and expect to see a response that's gonna tell you what to do. So I mentioned that the policy solution to health inequalities is a very complex solution. Health in all policies, which is the sort of the package that has been adopted at the European level um, and also within numerous countries um, in the UK often referred to as cross sectoral policymaking or joined up government. It's an incredibly complex policy package. This graphic that I'm showing you here, you're not going to be able to read. Um, and that's the whole point. This is from the World Health Organization up at the top. It says, what is health in all policies? <laughs> and what you see is an absolute alphabet soup of, of multi-level, multi-sectoral, multiple social determinants of health, all having to be held together with intense cooperation and coordination across multiple government ministries. And not surprisingly, even in the very strong bureaucracies that I studied in the course of my book, um, this kind of very complex policy solution uniformly fails to produce the expected gains in terms of reducing health inequalities. So what's happening here, I argue, is that reframing inequality as a problem of inequalities in human capital, and in particular health, um, has shifted the Overton window around inequality. The Overton window is the range of, of 
policy solutions to a problem that seems reasonable or possible in a given particular environment. And we can see if you look to the left in the, the red dashed line, you know, in the 1950s and 1960s, the, the Overton window around inequality included some things that right, you know, today we would think of as pretty radical, you know, restricting high incomes, confiscating property. We don't do those kinds of things anymore. By the 1970s, 1980s, it started to shift rightward. And by the 1990s and 2000s, the window of political possibility, the Overton window around reframing inequality really looks like social investment, activation, privatization, health and all policies, these very kind of complex technocratic policy levers, which we're, <clears throat> we're trying to use to, to reduce inequalities. So to summarize, The argument that I make in regimes of inequality is that this we see a sort of common three-step process occurring across the rich democracies that explains the failure to reduce inequality um, in beginning in the 1990s and 2000s. So this three-step process starts with a conflict between rising neoliberalism and the fundamental mechanisms for ensuring some level of inequality reduction uh, that are built into post-war welfare regimes, which lead to political taboos. Politicians then reframe the issue of inequality in order to avoid this political taboo, drawing upon an alternative available inequality frame, in this case, health inequalities, which has been developed at the European le level and is really kind of ripe for the taking at this point. This reframing in turn leads to a shift in the Overton window around inequality and ultimately a failure to reduce inequality. So <clears throat> at a more abstract level, we can think about inequality as being particularly persistent in part because of social construction that reframing inequality or framing inequality as a public problem um, affects the tools that seem like reasonable responses. And in the case of the reframing of inequality, this leads to uh, a set of tools that are not particularly effective. We can also think of inequality as being persistent because of path dependence. I haven't talked about it a lot in this talk, um, but in the book, I show that the pathways to reframing, sort of the, the, the way that these taboos are generated and the different taboos that are generated in different kinds of welfare states are really shaped by the long shadows of post-war welfare regimes. Finally, inequality is persistent because it has a regime-like characteristic. That's why I called the book Regimes of Inequality. Um, and regimes are characterized by interlocking parts. So it's not just one thing happening over here and another thing happening over here, and you sort of additively can add them all together and say, oh, that's the politics of inequality. No, the politics of inequality is really about these interlocking power configurations, ideas, institutions, practices, logics of appropriateness, um, and multiple forms of inequality, both income inequality and health inequality, that are interconnected and complementary. So the interlocking of parts in a regime um, leads these regimes of inequality to be rather self-reproducing. The institutions that were designed to contain inequality in the post-war period end up getting repurposed um, and new, less equal regimes of inequality develop drawing on those, on those old bits and pieces. So inequality is a tough nut to crack. Well, inequality, sorry, I have a little repetition of my slides here. Oh, ignore the first two bullet points. <laughs> um, and let's get down to the syndemic. So I've just talked about regimes as having these interlocking parts and being self-reproducing. This idea of regimeness in political science is very similar to what public health people talk about as a syndemic. So a syndemic is a set of at least two linked widespread health problems that interact synergistically, tending to reproduce and exacerbate each other. And I want you to keep in mind this idea of a syndemic as sort of a regime of different kinds of health inequalities as I take you into the next book. So the unequal pandemic, which is coming out in June, discusses the syndemic inequalities that underlie the results that we're seeing in COVID-19.
So in this book, we start from the observation that the initial framing of the COVID-19 pandemic was really about equality, right? Death doesn't discriminate, we're all in it together, but now we know, right? The pre-pandemic inequalities that have always existed that governments did not successfully combat in the 1990s and 2000s, these inequalities are very strongly related in a syndemic way to COVID-19 inequalities. Now we're seeing kind of a new, a new narrative around COVID-19, which is that a lot of the inequalities that we're seeing are really linked to botched responses on the part of the government. Um, and this narrative has a lot of force because it's not wrong, right? <laughs> Governments in the US and the UK in particular, um, many aspects of their COVID response were indeed terrible and led to even worse inequalities than we might've expected to see otherwise. Um, I think in Sweden, you know, botched maybe, but certainly we can see that the, the, the way that the government responded uh, led to continuing inequalities. We argue in this book that this is not about mistakes, that what happened during the pandemic, the emergence of inequalities during the pandemic um, was not about governments making mistakes, that policy responses to COVID-19 are in fact in large part on path for welfare regimes, and that these syndemic inequalities that we observe are the result of long-term <clears throat> policy strategies and political choices that are linked to regimes of inequality, which is why I'm talking about two books in one talk today. So there are lots of different things that governments can do in response to the pandemic. Um, much of what people focused on very early on was about containment, testing and tracing, lockdown, school closures, travel restrictions, um, now also vaccination, right? But there are lots of other things that governments do. They intervene in healthcare systems. They uh, make policies that affect essential workers, the people who have to go to work, who can't stay home. Um, they intervene in social policies uh, in ways to support people who have to stay home from work or businesses that are, that are affected um, by closures. Uh, and again, economic and labor market in interventions that aren't occurring as part of the social welfare system, but, but that broadly affect firms and workers. So, so far, most of the research on government responses to the pandemic has really focused on, on the containment phase, um, in part because it's a little easier to measure. Um, but one of the things that we talk about in the unequal pandemic is some ongoing research that I'm doing um, that is about the other kinds of government responses. So what else is what else are governments doing? And I draw on um, on policy interventions that are listed in the Oxford Super Tracker, which is a great resource, um, but also um, drawing on information gathered by European labor organizations and from government documents to look at first at a relatively small set of country cases um, in North America and in Europe and try to figure out what it is that governments are actually doing here. And I have a wonderful team of UPenn undergrads who I just have to shout out to by name, Brendan Louie, Gabriella Rubito, and Anna Schwartz, who um, did magnificent work collecting uh, some of these early data that we draw on here. So what we find is that about that governments are choosing, regardless of whether it's in the US or the UK <clears throat> or Germany, governments are choosing from the same basic menu of things that they can do to help during the pandemic. Um, so there's a series of things that they can do to help people, to help individuals kind of cope with their living expenses at a time when their income has declined. Um, governments find ways to support firms in the private sector, both to help them help their own employees, but also to, to kind of keep them going. Um, there are a range of supports for essential workers. And finally, there are interventions in the health sector. Essentially, all governments do most of this kind of thing. So what varies is sort of the specific dishes on the menu or the portion sizes and the clientele who gets to eat at the menu. Um, 
So we're really thinking about where does this variation in government responses to the pandemic come from? And some of the variation is clearly unsystematic. That's what happens in a crisis. People, you know, government officials are people, they make decisions under stress. And, you know, some of those decisions are pretty idiosyncratic. Some of what we see is clearly related to state structure. So there are certain things that you can do if you have a very centralized versus a very decentralized um, system. Uh, and so some of the differences between countries and policy responses seem to be related to that. Government partisanship does seem to have some influence, but it doesn't seem to determine kind of overall levels of generosity or um, sort of uh, reflectiveness about what might really be needed to, to build an equitable outcome uh, as we come out of the pandemic. Most of the variation that we see in government responses to the pandemic actually is really congruent with previous policy patterns. So it's exactly what we would expect to see um, if we think of welfare regimes and regimes of inequality casting very long shadows. So in the, we can sort of use broadly Esping Anderson's three-part typology of worlds of welfare. In the liberal world of welfare, we see governments doing pretty much what you would expect. Yes, they're assisting people uh, with their living expenses, but that assistance tends to be temporary and at a relatively low level. There are not a lot of supports for essential workers or indeed for other workers. Um, and the economic and labor market interventions that liberal governments use tend to employ um, things like um, manipulation of credit and availability of tax relief rather than direct payments or direct subsidies. Conservative corporatist regimes, as one might expect, um, show a lot of variation in what are the rights of workers under this pandemic, you know, pandemic era expansion of social benefits. Um, and also we see a very typical for a conservative corporatist regime, relatively generous subsidies for passive labor market policies, um, things that keep people out of work and subsidize them to stay out of work, uh, which would be deemed absolutely horrific by, by policymakers in many other countries. Um, finally, in the social democratic regime, not surprisingly, we see a greater focus on services, for example, childcare and mental health services, um, and on maintaining employment at high levels. Uh, pretty generous policies for essential workers um, relative to what's happening in other countries. And benefits tend to be universal um, and sometimes not even restricted by citizenship, uh, as opposed to this very kind of differentiated or means tested um, programming that we see in liberal and conservative corporatist regimes. So this is exactly what if you just picked up Esming Anderson's Three Worlds of Welfare Capitalism, night circa 1990, this is exactly what you would expect. And it's pretty much exactly what you see. Now, of course, there are some exceptions. Uh, in fact, the CARES Act in, in the US um, shows some really interesting path departing things like, you know, funding paid sick leave for the first time ever. Um, so it's not all that's going on, but the overwhelming majority of policies that we see put into place by governments in response to the pandemic are pretty much what you would expect. So why is this? Why is the COVID-19 response so strongly path dependent? Well, a really important reason is that it's much easier to extend a pre-existing program than to create a new one. And so most of the policies that we see are extensions of policies that already existed before the pandemic. Um, secondly, politicians seem to stick with, with a repertoire of policy tools that they're comfortable with. So subsidies, cash payments may be more comfortable in a conservative welfare regime, whereas tax relief uh, is gonna be more comfortable in a liberal welfare regime. Finally, uh, underlying attitudes and ideologies about inequality surely impact the decisions that governments are making. So for example, beliefs about deservingness, moral hazard or racial inferiority um, are probably driving the COVID-19 response as well as driving some of these underlying um, pre-existing policy patterns. So there may be sort of an omitted variable there. All right, so here's regimes of inequality, but with a COVID-19 
globule rather than a cake, which is really pretty sad because I think everybody can agree that a cake is better. What's going on? How do we explain the new, new normal of high COVID-19 inequality? Well, here's the thing. There's actually not a lot new going on. Um, health inequalities are strongly related at the individual and societal level to SES inequalities. Remember, economic inequality is a fundamental cause of health inequalities. And COVID-19 is no different. We see the same syndemic bundling of inequalities and persistent regime types that we saw in my book that was published you know, before the pandemic came out. So this is not a new story. The inequalities that we're seeing emerging from COVID-19 are no different uh, from the inequalities that pre-existed the COVID-19 because they are caused by the inequalities that pre-existed COVID-19. So what do we take away from this? Well, I think there are a couple lessons for the study of comparative social policy that are worth paying attention to. And first is that we cannot assume that a global pandemic is going to be a critical juncture. It may be. Uh, it may be that the US welfare state, for example, is about to be utterly transformed. My goodness, I hope so, <laughs> right? But I don't think we can assume that that's the case. I think we should assume instead that the politics of inequality will continue to wear the long shadows of these post-war strategies for taming markets. And the very tight coupling of dimensions of inequality within a regime are probably gonna continue to make inequalities relatively persistent. Um, secondly, the framing of inequality continues to matter for the policy choices that we make and for how effective these policies ultimately are. I worry that the pandemic is likely to produce a further medicalization of the problem of inequality. And in one sense, this is good news for people who have been trying to get more attention drawn to the issue of health inequalities, um, and particularly racial and ethnic health inequalities. Um, but I worry that this increasing medicalization of the problem may actually affect the policy response to COVID in ways that makes the syndemic harder to resolve. So for example, we may see a greater focus on healthcare, on disaster preparedness, versus focusing on the income distribution, which is really what's underlying these inequalities. My computer is just telling me that a new version of Java is available. <laughs> Great. All right, lessons for policy. So we need, to get out of this inequality COVID-19 syndemic. We need policies that reduce the unequal health impact of the pandemic. Things like paid sick leave, access to health care, protections for essential workers, um, consideration of the unequal mental health uh, impact of lockdowns, for example. But we also need policies that reduce the unequal socioeconomic impact of the pandemic. So things like supports for unemployed workers and affected businesses, prioritizing childcare and school openings. We also need policies that will address the underlying socioeconomic inequalities that are the fundamental drivers of health inequalities. And we need policies that will break the link between low socioeconomic status and poor health if we possibly can. So addressing the hollowing out of the second to fifth deciles of the income distribution, you know, really getting at these underlying socioeconomic inequalities will be helpful. Um, but also things like improved nutrition programs, green space, working time restrictions that help people who have low SES be in better health. Um, this is my last slide, Jonathan. Why don't we have all these things already? Um, well, partly because these syndemic inequalities that I've been talking about skew who's alive to vote. People who are in worse health and who are on the lower end of the socioeconomic status spectrum don't vote in part because they're dead. We also know that strong segregation by both socioeconomic status and ethnicity can undermine a sense of solidarity that, that is really necessary to create the welfare states um, that sustain all of our health. What can we do to change that? I think changes to parties and how they recruit um, lawmakers can be really helpful. Electoral system reforms that target malapportionment 
um, and possibly even introducing some participatory institutions. We talk about this in the unequal pandemic. I'm not 100% convinced about all of this, um, but, but I think it's worth thinking about as a, if we want to move to a lower inequality equilibrium, um, something's got to give. And so political changes are, I think, just as necessary as policy changes. So I'll end there. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we have a load of questions piling up. Um, oh, so I'm, I'm just gonna, uh, you don't, you have time to take a deep breath before we uh, throw you back in the deep end. So yeah, I mean, that, that, that was great. And I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's uncanny the way in which the two books fit together as a story <laughs> and, um, and natural in a way, but you know, it's um, you can almost seamlessly fit them together into the same talk because they're asking many of the same questions. And in some ways, the pandemic is revealing the importance of what, what you're saying in the 2020 book. So great. Um, let's start with a question from William Hopwood, who asks, should we uh, return to the kinds of policymaking decisions uh, like those we took in the wake of the Second World War, for example, in the UK case, creating uh, the National Health Service to revitalize healthcare services. So do you see, I guess, this being an opportunity to create a kind of post-war scenario where we all of a sudden do all these things we should have been thinking of doing years ago? I think we certainly have an opportunity. I think there are a lot of... Um, there, there are many ways though in which this may also be a constrained moment. So I would like to sort of caution us against thinking about wars and pandemics as always, always being these sort of moments of, of unconstrained choice. Um, there certainly are opportunities to uh, build a new sort of spirit of solidarity in, our, in, in the public. Um, but I worry that the pandemic has been experienced in such an unequal way in, in certainly both in the US and the UK that you know, we really are living in different worlds. So I, for example, nobody in my sort of immediate personal circle uh, has died from COVID nor have any of their family members died from COVID. Whereas if I look to any of my African-American colleagues or coworkers or neighbors, all of them know someone who has died. And so the very strong differentiation, not only by race, but also by social class and geography, I think has led us to experience the pandemic in very different ways. And I think that that puts a little bit of a break on this idea that we can just sort of change everything about the way that, that we have dealt with inequality in the past. Yeah, actually, we have a number of questions on similar theme on a similar theme here about whether this is a change point. But I'm just going to throw them at you so you can have answer the same kind of question from a different ang angle. Sure. Because Tatiana, Tatiana Bellametti of SOAS asks, do you think COVID-19 has forced governments to acknowledge pervasive inequalities and will the pandemic offer an opportunity to recover in a more inclusive way? I mean, what, what you're suggesting there is that in some ways, um, the fact that we haven't all felt in the same way means that, um, that, that that kind of deadens the opportunity. But but another way of looking at it is that people have been forced to confront it, and certainly governments have been forced to confront it. So do you think there's any kind of positive side of not notwithstanding this inequality you've just highlighted, that, that the fact that we can't ignore, you know, the fact that this kind of thing that we normally ignore when it's so dramatic, it becomes front page news. Surely that makes a difference to our politics, or, or are you equally pessimistic about that? Well, look, I mean, I don't want to be a totally glass half empty voice here. I mean, I do think that there are reasons to hope. Um, I look at what is happening in, in policymaking circles in the US right now with the combination of the pandemic and you know, utter exhaustion with the insanity of the of the Trump era. And I think there really are reasons to, to hope that people are making bold moves and that these bold moves 
while they're envisioned as temporary at the moment, some of them could take hold. So I don't think this has to be a, a totally glass half <laughs> empty kind of moment. But I, I think that we tend to think of moments like this as moments of real openness and possibility, which is wonderful because you need hope right now. But I, as a scholar of social policy and a scholar of inequality, have to sort of fall back on, on what I've learned in the course of my research. And what I've learned in the course of my research is that this stuff is really, really persistent. It's persistent because we're not living on the same planet, really, a lot of the time. Um, it's persistent because governments really do tend to fall back on the tools that they've used in the past, many of which, you know, create these same inequalities. Um, and it's and it's persistent because, you know, let me put it this way. When there was a shift to talking about health inequalities in public, in politics, starting in the 1990s, all the social epidemiologists in the world were like, yay, we did it, we finally did it, we won, we finally got people to pay attention to this problem. And what happened? They paid attention to the problem, they got it into the political discourse, and it reshaped policy making in a way that made the problem much worse. So we're actually in a worse off position now than we were before the, before the social epidemiologists kind of got their message across in some ways. So I think it's really, you know, there are some double-edged swords here that we have to pay attention to. Great, so um, moving on to Greg Simkins, who's an economist in the UK Civil Service, service. so um, presumably in some way involved with dealing with this, this terrible crisis. And he, he's um, citing Walter Scheidel's great leveler book. So I get the, his question is, you know, you know the Scheidel story for those who are not familiar with the book. The argument is that, you know, we finally deal with inequality when societies are faced with some extreme shock or crisis. He cites plagues, wars, revolutions. Um, so is COVID-19 enough of a shock for us to draw on Scheidel's uh, argument to justify some kind of, of shift? Um, you know, it, is, is this enough? Um, so I actually mentioned Scheidel's book in, in the first chapter of Regimes of Inequality. Little did I know that, you know, a pandemic was about to befall us. Um, you know, I think part of the problem with arguments like this is that we don't really know what's enough. You know, ex ante, how do we know what is a shock that is big enough or that hits in the right way or hits the right people? Um, to cause this sort of, you know, real uh, kind of ideological realignment. Maybe this is it, but I think we're really not gonna know until we're looking backward. And one of the things that Scheidel has going for him <laughs> is that he's a historian, right? So he gets to look backwards. Um, and I think, you know, one of the, I remember being on Twitter sort of in the early phases of the pandemic and, and one of the, because I'm a total nerd, one of the first things that sort of occurred to me about this was, you know, what does this do to our thinking about critical junctures, right? How does the pandemic affect the way that we think about how do we know a critical juncture when we see it? And I don't think we have any better answers to that today than we did before. I mean, generally speaking, critical junctures are much easier to recognize in retrospect. And so I think the answer to the question, is this going to be the big political juncture? you know, critical juncture um, of, you know, the century is, you know, we don't know yet. We'll know in 20 years. Hedging your bets there, I see. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I've been thinking about this a lot too. And the first thing that occurs to me is that the drama of, you know, the war or revolutions or other forms of massive social breakdown I complained on Twitter the other day that I hadn't been out of the country for six months, and that's the first time in 30 years that had happened to me. Right. It's not really on the same scale. Obviously, I'm one of the privileged people less affected by this, um, but uh, but yeah, maybe it isn't on a sufficient scale to really change things, but as you say, we're, we will see. So let's um, take a more global perspective of the next few questions. Uh, Aya Lal of the School of 
Public Policy asks, how will developing countries survive the threat of COVID-19 and the inequalities between lower classes and politicians? And yeah, this is... <laughs> economy is expert, but um, right. what are your so, thoughts about? I, I mean, I guess I can, uh, this is certainly not my area of greatest expertise. I can for a moment put on my hat as a journal editor. Um, I happen to be editing a special issue of the Journal of Health Politics, Policy and Law, uh, which looks at com comparative uh, policy responses to COVID uh, in a number of lower income countries. Um, and I think, you know, what we're, what we're seeing coming out of, of many countries uh, in the global south is, you know, pretty sensible policy responses, actually. So, I mean, the first stroke of, of good luck is just that because of the seasonality um, of the vaccine, uh, it didn't hit as hard right away. Uh, and then it also, you know, because of the, the lesser amount of sort of global connectivity um, in lower income countries, there weren't as many people coming in um, bringing the virus. And so it was a little easier to get a handle on it early. So there are many countries in the global south that have done really well so far um, and, and whose experiences in dealing with the HIV AIDS pandemic, with Ebola, with SARS, with MERS have really prepared them to deal pretty effectively um, with pandemics. And so I think in many instances, the response has, has been really kind of better than what we've seen in the rich industrialized democracies of the global north. On the other hand, obviously, they have far fewer resources to deal with a problem like this. And it's unclear what the vaccination response is going to look like. Um, I'm really encouraged to see that the Biden administration and, and many of its proxies kind of in the private sector in the US um, are really pushing for a greater US involvement in getting vaccines out um, to the world. Um, but it's going to take time. And yeah, I guess I can just say that that I've been encouraged by a lot of the policy responses, particularly in smaller countries of the global south. Um, some of the larger countries um, have not responded as well. Brazil, I think, has been an example of, of a country where the response has, has not been helpful. Um, I'm not sure if that, I'm not sure if my response was very helpful there, but, but that's about all I have to say. Great. Um, yeah, actually, I mean, that, that leads nicely into the next question from Pritesh, who's a doctor in the East Kent NHS Trust, so somebody who's been on the front line through this, uh, asking about your thoughts on um, working on these inequalities on a global scale, and in particular citing the example of how advanced countries, especially the UK and US, have infinitely more COVID vaccines than poorer countries. Um, obviously, you just mentioned this, but I mean, what, what, what's your view about the kind of how global inequality is going to shape the Because after all, the point about a pandemic is, well, it's global, right? Right, it's global and it's unequal. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think there there are precedents for making um, for making vaccines available throughout the world, right? This is actually something that we know how to do. Um, and with, you know, with PEPFAR, with HIV AIDS, um, also with not just with vaccines, but with therapeutics. So, I mean, clearly the governments in the global north whose big pharmaceutical corporations hold the patents um, for the production of vaccines they are going to need to pressure these companies to partner with producers in the global south to produce vaccines and right now china and russia are doing that and they're doing it on a sort of bilateral friends and family kind of basis right um, and so whatever you may think of the quality of the Chinese and Russian vaccines, they're getting out there, at least in a limited way. It is incumbent upon the U.S. and the governments of, of Europe um, to make sure that our pharmaceutical corporations are also in a position um, to release those the stranglehold on the patents and make sure that vaccines are getting produced and are getting out to everybody and not just our friends and family. So that I think would, would make a big difference. 
Great, thanks. Okay, um, our last question coming up. So this is from Zoltan Herzeg. I'm not sure if I pronounced that very well, from the University of Warwick. Do you think that the voice of the people who've been mostly affected by the pandemic is heard? And if so, is their side properly represented in the process of solving inequality? And I think that's, <laughs> that's a big question, I guess, which underlies this. What a wonderful, wonderful question um, to end on. So I think those are, in fact, two very different issues. I think that the voices are being heard, and I think that's something new. In the United States, the Black Lives Matter movement is being heard. I mean, I, like, I'm shocked. <laughs> but the combination of the stark, stark inequalities that were evident very early on in the pandemic and a social movement that was already activated and ready to go because of the police violence against Blacks. That combination has been incredibly powerful and it has amplified the amplified the voices of communities who were simply not being heard. 20 years ago, these conversations that I've had with medical schools, with um, you know, with policymakers about racial inequalities in, in health in the US, none of these conversations would have taken place. So this, it's been long, slow work. People, you know, social epidemiologists have been tilling this ground for decades. The Black Lives Matter movement was in place and ready to go. And then you saw this early publication of data, really shocking data. So in the US, at any rate, these voices, I think, are being heard. And changes in sort of the structure of the Democratic Party also have helped, right? These voices are being amplified because it's become very clear that Democrats can't win without them. So voices are being heard. Are they being represented, right? Do they really have a voice in the policymaking that's going to follow? This I'm less sure about. Um, I suspect that the sort of top-down policymaking that, that uh, often characterizes emergency response is going to continue for a while, and that the kind of bottom-up sort of listening to people and their experiences and trying to understand what problems do our policies create for communities and how can we best resolve those. Um, I'm not sure that I'm seeing a lot of movement toward a new kind of policymaking. Um, but I think at the very least, the people who are making top-down policy at this point have heard those voices and, and they know that they, at some level, have to listen and have to respond. I guess I'll, I'll end wow, there. Fantastic. Um, what a great way to, to end a, a fascinating talk. And um, it's a shame we don't have more time because I think there are a bunch of questions uh, waiting, but we, we have to wrap up, unfortunately. So um, it, just to reiterate what a pleasure and a delight it was to, to have you here at, virtually at LSE. Um, and, you know, what a great talk. And thanks to you all for, for coming, taking time out of your busy schedules to, to attend, attend this talk. Just a reminder, you can purchase the book Regimes of Inequality, um, there is a link on the web listing for this talk and also in the chat if you want to uh, dig that out. And, um, and yeah, I strongly recommend it, but also save some money for the uh, Julie's forthcoming book uh, with, with Claire and Claire. So chat. Cambridge is going to kill me for saying this, but they have promised that there is paperback <laughs> coming out. It was supposed to be out in March. So if you don't like the, you know, 90 pound price tag of the hardcover <laughs> i would wait that that might that might be good good advice especially for our students yeah exactly. okay well thank you so much and thanks for everybody else for coming and yeah uh, we'll wrap it up here yeah Have a good thanks evening, so much everyone. for having me